So hi everyone, today we have Kara as our speaker. She is an assistant professor at University of New Mexico. Uh, she's going to talk about clonable polymers and their cryptographic applications. Okay, uh, hey everyone. Thank you for the introduction and thanks for being here. Uh, as Kay said, uh, in this talk, I present our work on unclonable polymers and their cryptographic applications. Uh, please stop me anytime to ask questions. Interactive talks are way better than just me talking. Uh, this is a joint work with Ran Kaneti, Yaniv Erlech, Jonathan Garshoni, Tal Malkin, Itzik Pierre, Anna Reutberg Berman, and Iran Tromer. Uh, and I want to mention, apparently this is not working. Okay. Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, I want to mention that this is an interdisciplinary research effort. We have a diverse team uh, covering several fields, including cryptography, uh, computational biology, and biochemistry. So let's start. Imagine that we have memory devices that are unclonable. And once the data is retrieved or the stored message is retrieved, uh, this memory device will self-destruct. Furthermore, if this device stores several messages, only a few of them can be retrieved before having that device fully destructed. Having such bounded query memory devices allow us to uh, build many applications. Among them, we have bounded execution software, which are uh, programs or, or kind of like they are known as one and K time programs. And these are programs that can be executed over uh, a few uh, inputs, uh, but not that many. Uh, we know that these bounded execution software, we cannot do them uh, using software only. Even in the quantum model, we need these special memory devices in order to build bounded execution quantum programs. This idea was put forward by uh, Goldwasser, Kalai, and Rothblum uh, in their work about one-time uh, programs. Basically, they assumed the existence of one-time memory devices, uh, and they used them to build one and k-time programs using garbage circuits. These memory devices, basically, uh, a memory device will store two messages, and you can retrieve only one of them, but not both, which imitates uh, the functionality of non-interactive oblivious transfer, which is one out of two oblivious transfer. That was just an assumption, and that work just discussed high-level direction of how to build these devices from uh, tamper-proof hardware tokens. In fact, the only way that we know to build these special memory devices is by tamper-proofing a whole computation while assuming that these hardware tokens resist side-channel attacks and reverse engineering. At that point, we wondered if we can build these special memory devices from alternative hardness assumptions. Uh, in order to achieve this goal, we joined forces with top-notch and brave biologists in order to find an alternative technology to build these bounded execution memory devices, or basically unclonable and self-destructive memory devices. We, yeah, go ahead. So, so what, what's, the, what's the relationship between the one-time memory device and unclonable um, memory device? So uh, if it is unclonable, uh, you cannot kind of like replicate it and doing more and more read uh, queries with that memory device. So you have just one shot. You, you have one memory device, you can retrieve the message. Once it is retrieved, it's self-destruct. If it is a clonable, you can clone it and query the second message. So you will not have the one out of two OT functionality, for example. So they are kind of like related, the self-destruction and the unclonability. Um, also, we want to do that in a rigorous way, uh, laying down foundational modeling and analysis uh, of the capabilities and security guarantees that we can achieve. And we uh, devise uh, many uh, amplification techniques uh, in order to amplify the weak memory devices that we build in order to build more sophisticated and provably secure cryptographic applications. 
This quest was inspired uh, by recent advances in bioengineering uh, and biochemistry, which allowed storing digital data in the form of DNA. So basically, you take a digital message, you encode it uh, into a sequence of nucleotides, and then you synthesize this uh, sequence into a DNA material. Don't worry about the biological details here. Just keep in mind that I can take a digital message uh, store it in the form of DNA. And if I am given that DNA sample or material, I can retrieve the digital message back. However, DNA evolved to be clonable. So if you have a sample of DNA, you can replicate it as many times as you want, meaning that you can read the uh, sample or the digital message as many times as you want. Uh, this made us look for alternative biological polymers and in fact, proteins can be used in a similar manner to store digital messages. The difference is that now you encode the message as a sequence of amino acids, and then you synthesize uh, this sequence into protein material. And here, the magic started. For starters, proteins are unclonable. The central dogma of molecular biology states that once information, which is the genetic information, has got into a protein, it cannot get out again. Uh, this challenge is still standing for 65 years now and even billions of years of evolution, uh, and which means that given a protein, you cannot clone it and you cannot go back to DNA, but given a DNA, you can use it to synthesize or produce protein. So to us cryptographers, this is just a biochemical uh, one-way function. And as cryptographers, we know what to do with hardness. We turn hard lemons into lemonade. And this is exactly what we're doing in this work. Another amazing feature of proteins is that reading proteins, which is to determine the sequence of amino acids, which is basically the digital message, is a destructive process. So once you feed the protein sample uh, into this uh, sequencing machinery, which is the mass spec, uh, it will destroy the bonds in the protein in order to tell you what is uh, the sequence of amino acids representing that protein, meaning that you cannot get the biological material back. Okay, so you, uh, yeah. may I ask a question? So if you can read information from the protein, why is it hard to reverse that protein to its original amino acid sequence? Uh, because in order to determine that sequence, which is the sequencing here, you need an amount of protein that is large enough above the threshold and you need it to be pure. So if you have small amounts of protein that are impure, you cannot even get anything. So this machinery, for example, if I feed it with a sample of collection of proteins, not just one, so it is impure, the output will be null, nothing. So you're right, if I provide you with pure enough protein, yes, you can read it, you can determine the sequence, which is basically the digital message, and you can do that again. Take that message, synthesize it into protein, and produce several copies. But giving you a protein that you don't know what is it, and it's very small amount and impure, you cannot say, okay, fine, let me replicate it and do as many read, just like try and error, right? Just like read this protein as many times as you want. You cannot do that. So it's like you have very small amount of protein and it's hard to revert it, but you are able to do some memory read in those small amount of protein. Is that right? If it is pure enough. Okay. If it is impure, and this is actually what, what we are relying on in our construction. So it is not just, oh, synthesize the message into protein and you're done. No, no, no. Because if I give you that pure protein, okay, yeah, just read it and then synth synthesize as many times as you want, which is basically you are replicating it. Okay. So there are some additional more techniques. More. Yep. What is a pure protein? Pure protein means that there is only one protein in the, uh, in the sample. So, you know, there are, I don't know, I don't know how many types of proteins out there. Yeah. So if you have collection of different proteins mixed with each other, mm -hmm. this is considered impure. If you have a sample with high enough of one of these proteins, this is considered pure. Okay. So um, is there like a, a 
geographic way to think of pure and impure? Yeah, I'm going to tell you about it in a few minutes. <laughs> so based on these observations that sequencing proteins is uh, destructive and proteins are unclonable, we uh, proposed a novel construction of consumable storage devices. And at a high level, uh, this works as follows. As before, you take your secret message M, you synthesize it into the form of a protein, call it the target protein, protein M here. Then we connect it to another short protein sequence uh, that we call it a header. And this header is recognized by the matching antibodies. So if you have the description of that header, you'll be able to uh, define or identify the matching antibodies. Furthermore, we mix the target protein with a massive set of other random proteins that are connected to different random keys or heads. So to us, the secret message, the protein M is our secret message. The header connected to that protein is our secret key. This is mixed with a massive set of random uh, proteins. So the sample itself is impure. And this vial of the random mix, which is uh, here our co-author Anna is holding in this photo, is the consumable token. So this is the encoding process. So now we constructed the consumable token for you. And the question is, how can you retrieve the message back? Remember, if I take this vial or this uh, impure mix and give it to the mass spec, it will output nothing because it will be, okay, this is impure. I can't determine which protein you're talking about. But in order to retrieve M, you will do the following. First of all, you have to purify the sample. You do that by applying the matching antibodies to the secret header, and this will pull down the target protein that you are after. Once you do that, now you have a pure protein sample. You, uh, we will cleave the header out of the uh, target protein. And now we feed that to mass spec and mass spec will tell us the sequence of the amino acids, which is determining that protein. And then we can decode it back to get the message. So there is a protocol to do that. You cannot deal just with the random mix and say, okay, I can sequence it and I can get the message back. Any questions? Um, okay. <laughs> Okay. So it's like when you have the key, in some sense, your message can be cloned. Is that correct? I wouldn't say can be cloned. It can be retrieved. Okay. Um, and so yeah. you have a big bottle of like a lot of protein, mm -hmm. and you have a lot of decoy, and you have your real message out there. Like it's state is inclonable. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. But we only care about that real message out there. So if you can, if you have the key and you retrieve it, and then you have, so you, you make another copy of that protein and you mix it up with another bottle of the core. Yeah, and once you get M, yes. But the, the way we are, I can say, what we are after is not that, oh, yeah, as an honest party, you get M. Okay, fine. You can synthesize it again and do multiple uh, tokens. But if that token, the adversary got hold of that token, he doesn't know the key. He just have uh, an impure mix of proteins. And at that point, he'll be like, okay, let's try these antibodies, which is, let's try key one, for example. Trying that key, will consume part of the, uh, of the vial that you cannot get back because you cannot clone uh, the, the protein if you don't know what's the sequence. Now the adversary will try another key and a third key, but he can do that for a limited number of keys because by the end of the day, this token or this vial will be consumed. So it is not about after I get the message, oh, I can synthesize it again. Yes, of course you can do. But what we are after is that you don't know what's in there as an adversary, so you are just trying stuff and you will not get anything. It's, yeah, it's, I would say it's not very direct that why this is uh, not clonable. Definitely, it is a combination of the self-destruction uh, and can, having impure and pure uh, consumable, or sorry, let me say vial and sample and so on. Okay. 
So it wasn't like, oh, we were so lucky. You will just synthesize the message into a protein and you're done. No, no, no. This took us long journey just to design it in this way. Because every time the design was like, oh, the adversary will be able to figure it out immediately. Given a pure sample is not good at all. Uh, mixed with few other proteins, it will not work because it will be also, you can purify it very quickly. You need this massive set and to be designed in a specific way as we have here. And yeah, go ahead. So, so you have to have the header yes. attached to the protein. Yes. Otherwise, you will not be able to pull it down from the impure sample, and basically your message is lost. So if you lose the description of the header, meaning that you will not be able to figure out the matching antibodies, your message is lost. Okay, and I should say that this is a simplified version of the protocol. The actual protocol, we deal with uh, phages and bacteria and just like to be able to build all of this. And we cannot even use all the amino acids out there because some of them will not be that stable when we are dealing with short messages and whatnot. So even the reality is more complicated than this. Also, we extend our protocol to uh, build what we call partially retrievable memory. So a vial will be able to store the messages using the secret keys, where only up to n of these uh, the messages can be retrieved. So even if you know the set of all keys, the B keys, you will not be able to retrieve more than N messages uh, because each query will consume part of the token. So uh, where is, so, so key is, key is the- The header. The header. Yes. And the antibody is kind of like the- The matching. Because like it is kind of the second part of the key, but it is the active part. So it is the matching one that will grab this protein to you from the header. So where is this then captured? Uh, and I will tell you in just like a few minutes. <laughs> so actually not a few minutes, just like a second. <laughs> so based on that, uh, we model it in what we call one NV consumable tokens. So basically, uh, we have two interfaces, encode and decode. Encode is creating the token that is storing the messages using B keys. The uh, honest party will do one or will be able to do one read query. So it will be able to retrieve only one message. While an adversary could be more powerful, has more advanced machines, will be able to operate at lower thresholds in the biochemical lab, and it will be able to do up to N queries. Meaning that from the V keys, the honest party will be able to try one, while the adversary will be able to try N, and in our design, N is less than V. So the adversary will not be able to retrieve all the messages, just up to N of them. Of course, this is if you apply one of the correct keys. So if you were applying keys outside the B set, then you will not get anything because this will not match any of the secret keys. This will produce impure protein sample for you that will output nothing when you sequence it. Um, after months and months of building this protocol and token, we spent more months to uh, derive or come up with the best model or the model that best represents biology. Our goal was to assume the minimum on the biology side while doing the rest of the heavy lifting and amplification on the cryptography side. In particular, and this is our informal model, our tokens can store only a small number of short messages using short keys. So at the cryptography level, we have to amplify that. The only meaningful interaction with these tokens is by applying uh, antibodies or the match of keys, like, let me say keys. So by playing with the token around and trying to, I don't know, get some information about it, based on the uh, biochemical uh, features of proteins and the protocol that we are building, you will not get anything. And each data retrieval attempt will consume part of the vial. So after even this is for the lucky adversary. After n queries, the whole vial will be gone, or, or, which means that the token will be consumed. And we account for powerful adversaries by saying that, hey, 
we designed the token that for the honest party that we know its capabilities will be able to do one query, but even the powerful adversary out there that we don't know about will be able to do up to n queries. So we have this power gap between the honest and the adversary uh, or the malicious party. And our token has non-negligible soundness error. So an adversary who might try an incorrect key will be lucky to get uh, the closest message to, to that key with probability gamma. So also we have to amplify that at the cryptography level to get non-negligible, sorry, to get negligible sound error. Yeah, go ahead. It's not a negligible, a non-negligible sound error because it's not the same key uh it, it is with respect to the keys themselves and the clauses between the keys okay so yeah i i don't want to get too much into the biology uh not for anything but because i'm not a biologist so i don't want to say something wrong but uh there is something about the antibodies that that they have closed features to each other. So it could be the case that you are using different antibody, but still they have some common features between each other. And due to the randomness into the biochemical procedures, you might be able to get that message or to get that matching protein. So we account for that by saying, okay, we give you non-negligible sound this error to account to the fact that there could be some closeness between the keys. So it is with respect to V and N at the same time, because it's the number of uh, oh, yeah. queries that you can do. So after that, we put our cryptography toolbox on the table and we ask two questions. How can we amplify these weak memory devices that support constant size storage to build uh, arbit or more sophisticated functionalities that operate on arbitrary size data? and how to do that in a provably secure way. This took us a long journey. First of all, we wanted to build a mathematical model that represents the uh, biological construction that we built. Uh, this produced what we call the vector-based model, where we model the vial as a vector of protein amounts, and we model all the biochemical procedures that you do in the wet lab as algorithms operating on these vectors. We also uh, defined an ideal functionality for consumable tokens with clean interfaces, and formally showed that uh, the vector-based construction realizes uh, or securely realizes this ideal functionality. Then we came up with several cryptographic and algorithmic amplification techniques uh, in, it, in order to uh, use uh, or to allow us to use uh, the consumable token functionality in advanced cryptographic applications. In this talk, also in this paper, uh, we talk about two applications. The first is digital lockers, and the other is one in time programs. Let's look at these uh, applications. So a digital locker, basically, you take a secret message and you encrypt it using a low entropy key, which is basically a human generated password. Uh, Kennedy and DuckDuck, uh, they came up with this notion and they showed a, they showed a construction uh, for digital lockers where the only possible attack against them is uh, brute search attacks. So basically the adversary can just like copy this encryption as many times as he wants and try the passwords in the password uh, space. Using our consumable tokens, we were able to strengthen that by saying that, okay, we allow you to build or to construct digital lockers, but guess what? They resist brute search attacks. In the sense that uh, this digital locker, you can interact with it up to K times or N times. So the adversary can try up to K passwords, not more. And you might say, okay, this is super easy. Uh, I don't know, your consumable token imitates that, but let me tell you first why it is not the case. And even this digital locker notion is basically uh, something that we call bounded query point function obfuscation. So this digital locker is um, a point function with multi-bit output. Uh, you try it on 
any point you want, if you hit the right point, you will get a message, which is uh, multi-bit output as output. We defined uh, an ideal functionality for this obfuscation um, where the honest party can do only one query. So she can try only one password while the adversary can try or can make up to n password guesses. And yeah, again, uh, you will say this is super easy. Take your consumable token, uh, store the secret message there under one secret key, which is uh, the password. But of course, you have to map that password to a token key to be within that uh, key space. And then uh, give the recipient uh, that consumable token. Uh, the adversary, even if he gets a hold on this vial, uh, he'll be able to try up to n keys, which corresponds up to n different passwords. But this is not correct, because remember, our consumable tokens, they have non-negligible soundness error. So the success probability of the adversary, it is not only n, which is the number of passwords that can be tried over the size of the password space, there is non-negligible soundness error there. You will say also, okay, this is super easy. We know how to do that. Just take the message, share it among you tokens. And now instead of requiring the honest party or the adversary to succeed in dealing with one token, you have to succeed with all these you tokens. Uh, and now the password P is mapped to you keys instead of just one. Uh, also, this will not work because all these tokens, they are tied with each other using the password. So if you succeed with any of these tokens, this will allow you to figure out the password. And once you figure out the password, you can map it to the rest of the keys of the rest of the tokens and get all the shares. We call that in our paper, leftover attack. Uh, and this will give the adversary additional queries. So instead of just saying, oh, you can try up to in passwords, now you can try up to U N passwords. And U has to be large enough to make the uh, sound this error negligible, which means that now you are giving the adversary many, many queries that may allow him even to broad search the whole uh, password space. So this doesn't work. And remember, yeah. yeah one more question. Um, yes. So I didn't understand why if you get one of the, you succeed with one of the keys, you get the password. In one share, then you get the password. Because remember, it is one password for all the tokens. And what we do here, if you see these functions, F1, F2, FU, oh. you, you take the one, because the, the setup is that the, uh, the recipient and the sender, they share one password. And they want to exchange this digital locker, right? So now the same password is mapped to all the keys. So if you succeed with anyone, you reverse that key to the password. And now just like do, the rest by mapping the password to the other keys. Can you, can you map it to like you out of use secret sharing? So if you have one of the shares, you cannot. If you, even if you don't like you might have one share, so you don't know what the secret is. What do you mean that you don't know what the secret is? Um, because think about it by the end of the day, I need a key to operate on the token. Right? Yes. And all these keys should be based on the same password. Ah, uh, I see. So okay, <laughs> now I'm going to tell you how, it, because yeah, uh, we did it, but generally, Kelly, just, just like to do it in the folklore way that, oh, you tokens, or I don't know, you shares, uh, you independent keys. Here, it's not that the keys are dependent, they have some connection between them which is the password P. So to avoid that, uh, we uh, require the tokens to be chained with each other, meaning that the adversary is forced and even the honest party is forced to operate on the tokens sequentially. So you have to operate on the first token first to get some random uh, uh, value or random string inside that token to allow you to generate the key for the second token. And then in order to operate on the third token, you need random values stored in the second and the first token and so on. And if you don't do that in sequence, and basically if you don't succeed with retrieving uh, the message and the random string from the previous token, now you have 
to guess that random strength, and it is coming from a large space. So the probability to guess that random strength successfully is negligible. By doing that and doing all the, the math and the analysis, now we succeed in making the probability, which is n over the size of the password, plus some negligible uh, value. And this is uh, the construction for bounded query, point function obfuscation, or basically digital lockers that resist brute search attack. The second application is one in time programs. These are secret programs or programs with some secret data or secret state that the honest party can execute this program over one input, while the adversary can execute it over up to n different inputs. That's it, nothing more. Tie it back to uh, GKR's notion, if you have one one time program, this is one time program. And if you have KK time program, this is K time programs in their notion. But remember, GKR, they have the strong assumption that they have one time memory devices, which we know that does not exist from uh, basic hardness assumptions. And what we are building is something in between because of the power gap uh, between the honest party and the adversary in our consumable token. So our application is more like it is built from real world memory devices rather than assume something is strong and take it from there. Um, would you mind explaining what is one end like? So uh, the program itself is a secret program or some program that has some secure uh, state. I don't know, maybe I can give you digital signature with my secret key inside. So this is the program. And I want to limit you to be able to execute that program only once. So you'll be able to sign just one message in, in this example. Uh, you as an honest party, yes, you will do that. And you will be only able to do that, which is run that program only once. Uh, a powerful adversary may be able to run that program up to n times. So they'll be able to sign up to n messages, but not more. So this is the notion of one end time program. So it is one time for the honest party, but it is n times for the adversary. And this is inherent because of the memory devices that we are building. So our construction uh, basically relies on obfuscating the program that contains the intended functionality F. And uh, this obfuscated program requires the following. In order to output F of X, which is the evaluation of the function over the input X, you must provide a secret message that corresponds to X. We store that secret message in a consumable token. So, uh, you will get two parts, the obfuscated function and or the obfuscated program, and you will get a consumable token. In order to execute the program over X, you have to query the consumable token first to get the message M, which is random stored in that token that corresponds to X. Then you present that to the obfuscated program. The program will check that these are compatible and after that will output F of X too. Uh, naturally, the adversary will be able to uh, query the consumable token up to n times, so he will get up to n messages corresponding up to n inputs and execute that program. But now you will ask the question that, hey, okay, remember, you told us that your consumable token can store just a small number of messages. This will correspond to a small number of inputs. So, okay, this will succeed for functions that have small domain. But how about functionalities or functions with large domains? Um, but I ask, how large is your large inputs? It can be exponential. Okay, so it's like you can output a like 256 bit number, or is that considered too large? So, Okay, that's, that's a great question. Even if the domain is small, and now my consumable token assume that it can store up to 10 messages. So the domain size here is just 10 inputs, right? So these are the number of inputs. But what is, what is stored inside the token is high entropy uh, strings. So it could be 128 or 256 random strings. So you cannot just like guess the message that corresponds to the input. You need to query the token in order to get it back. Mm -hmm. 
And when I talk about large domains, now I want to expand that to cover exponential number of inputs, where each input will have a long enough random string corresponding to it. So there are two stages. You need the random string that corresponds to the input. You will give that to the obfuscated program. If they match that the random string, or oh, this is the correct one that uh, correspond to the input, it will output f of x to you. Otherwise, it will output nothing. And in order to cover large domains, uh, we use linear error correcting codes, uh, where now it is not just I'm going to take the input and query the token to get the matching string. I have to do something first, which is I have to generate the valid code word that corresponds to my input, which will consist of omega symbols. And now the program will require me to provide omega random strings that corresponds to the code word of the input instead of the input itself. And to allow that, we send uh, the uh, recipient omega tokens instead of one. And the number of keys or messages per token, this is uh, the symbols or the alphabet for uh, my code that I'm using. And when you get the code word of the input, each symbol in that code word will tell you which key to use with each token. So you will operate on the Omega tokens, get Omega secret messages, feed these Omega secret messages to the obfuscated program. The program will check that, okay, this is the valid code word of the input. Are these the valid random strings that correspond to this code word? If the answer is yes, it will output f of x to you. If the answer is no, it will output nothing. Using uh, this approach, we are able to uh, cover uh, uh, a domain size of Q to the power D plus one. Q is uh, the alphabet or the number of symbols, sorry, uh, the alphabet size that we have, which is the number of keys. And D is the dimension of the code. Uh, also, that wasn't immediate. Uh, we had to configure the distance of the code that we are using in a way that uh, even though we are sending more tokens now, which means that the adversary gets more queries, that adversary will not be able to obtain more than n code words. So we are preserving the number of queries to be n, not to make it larger, especially that we are sending more tokens now. To conclude, in this work, we build uh, an innovative real world construction for unclonable and self-destructive memory devices. We provide formal treatment, uh, mathematical models, and provably secure cryptographic applications uh, of these uh, consumable tokens. Our future work directions are twofold. Uh, on the biology side, we are working on a sister paper uh, to show the full biological construction with uh, empirical experiments and results. And on the cryptography side, uh, we are refining our model and working on building more applications out of these memory devices. Thank you so much and happy to take questions. So do you have any cryptographic assumptions needed for the, for the, two, the two applications you mentioned, or it's just purely from the um, DNA no, definitely. We have, yeah, we have computational assumptions in the digital locker. We are working in the random oracle model. So this mapping from the password to the token space or the, the, key, the token key space, we use random oracles there. In the one end time program, we assume sub exponentially uh, IO and uh, one way functions. Wait, can you construct a random oracle based on? Biology technology? No, 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 we are using random oracles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but uh, you are assuming such oracle exists, but can you construct it? Like you have a very nice construction of, um, you know, the protein thing. But now, can you yes. construct a uh, random oracle? Like you just hard programming a lot of um, proteins in there and you allow them to achieve. That's a great question, and it is related to one of the directions that we are looking at now, which is uh, POPs, um, the unclonable functions, the sorry, yeah, the probabilistic unclonable functions. And it is not quite the same because it is tempting to say that, oh, you have 
a random protein mix, and maybe you can sequence, and every time you will get random protein out, right? Which is kind of like a random string. Uh, but it is not quite the same because of the requirement of the high, highly pure sample in order to feed into the mass spec and whatnot. So I don't see a direct yes, way to do it. Yeah, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe it requires another sophisticated protocol just like this one to, to obtain that. But yeah, for, for the minute, no, we don't have it. So, like, um, yeah. like, have you considered any like other um, like function generator or something, yes. something like that? So, I mean, like, why why we cannot use some sort of randomness instead of random model? Yeah. Again, I think I need to think more about it, although we thought about it at some point because we wanted to make the assumptions weaker. The construction that uses the IO, yeah, we are using PRGs uh, because, yeah, you have the seed, okay, life, life is good, but we already have IO, which is strong enough. So, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't really matter if you have something else next to it. Uh, but, yeah, for the digital lockers, uh, the PRGs, I guess what we faced is the need for this seed uh, mm -hmm. and how to communicate that seed for the PRG. And the minute you have a seed and now, oh, I have to send you some high entropy string. Yeah. So the whole setup of saying, oh, we just share a password, it's not valid anymore. So to keep kind of like the construction that, okay, the setup that we don't have anything else between us other than the password, we needed to use something that is keyless, that doesn't require this secret input that is high entropy. So we couldn't use PRGs at that point. So we ended up with the random oracle model. Yeah, and even for the IO, because think about it, um, again, it's a strong uh, assumption mm -hmm. and we are yeah, obfuscating the whole program. At least one of the, uh, can you see the approaches to limit the use of IO is to rely on uh, notions of reusable garbling, uh, where instead of uh, obfuscating or IOing, <laughs> according to one of my co-authors, the whole program, uh, you will be obfuscating just uh, the smaller circuit that encodes the input. Because in reusable garbling, you have to go to the garbler for every new input to encode it into some secret, and there, there will be a secret key there. And this is actually based on functional encryption, but it is used uh, or it is called reusable garbling. So we can obfuscate just that simple circuit. Uh, but still, we need IO in, in both constructions. I'm not sure if there are uh, questions from the people online or? Uh, I think no. Right. So I guess if there are there's no other question. Well, thank you again. Thank you so much.